five. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody who's watching physically in the room here or live streaming or later on. How about that? We're in two different places and two different time dimensions. Would you pray for us? Sure. Good. Thanks, Justin. Yep. Father God, we just come before you and just thank you for this opportunity to come together in a fellowship and just learn more about you and grow, grow closer to you, Lord. And I just uh, pray, Lord, that uh, just through this, uh, we can go to love you just a little bit more each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we are in chapter 5. And so this is beginning a real practical section of the book. The, and um, I want to show you something here, though. As, as we know, we looked at this last week uh, from the end of chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. The comparison between Hagar and Sarah, the two different systems really, law and grace. Um, one is physical, the other one is spiritual. Uh, one is temporal, the other one is eternal. Um, one is based on the law, one, the other one's based on grace. And um, he continues that comparison into chapter 5. But one of the things I wanted to show you was in chapter 4, Verse 26, if you look there in your Bibles, I showed you this last week. This is the New Jerusalem, and it says, But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. And so this is a <clears throat> what the New Jerusalem will look like. And I wanted to show you how big it was. I, I was kind of like looking through some old slides that I had of uh, from a Professor, uh, Dr. Constable, and he... Uh, these, so these slides are really old, but this is basically a footprint of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is going to be roughly 1,500 miles wide, and it's a cube. So 1,500 miles wide, that's what it looks like. would look like if it was hovering over the United States. We would notice it. It would be, <laughs> it would be <laughs> cast a nice shadow, and then there's how it would fit over the Middle East, especially over Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. I saw those. I was like, oh, i got to show the guys how big the New Jerusalem is going to be. And you can read the dimensions. You can look for yourself in Revelation 21. That's where it talks about the New Jerusalem. All right. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. So chapter 4 was obviously very key to understand chapter 5. And so chapter 4, uh, well, back in chapter 3, basically... Paul is making a very positive case for the grace through faith. Okay, so he just lists off all the advantages of grace over the law system in chapter 3. And then uh, he, he switches gears and looks at it from the negative vantage point in chapter 4 and makes the comparison again, but through a negative lens. Um, and basically in chapter 4, these are all the things you guys are losing because you're going back to the law system away from the grace system, the system in which you were saved. All right, so these are all the things that you're losing. So you guys are losers. This is what you're losing. Four, one through seven, you're losing your closeness with God. You're losing your Christian liberty, which she'll talk about later. In 12 through 16, you're losing ground in your spiritual growth. Um, you're hurting your relationship with other Christians. Uh, and he, he'll, we'll see some of that today as he emphasizes in verses uh, five and six, especially about love, right? Um, and then in the, what we looked at last week, you're losing the benefits of your spiritual birth in this life because you're going to the wrong system, all right? So this is all stuff that they're vulnerable to losing because of going back to the law system away from the grace system. Okay, so here's again, big picture, defense, doctrine, duty. We are now in the final approach, the last two chapters of the book of Galatians. And um, so let's look at this passage. Okay, I have a couple introductory statements to make for this passage of verses 1 through 6 of Galatians 5. You guys remember the, well, not remember the Emancipation Proclamation, but you remember what it is, right? None of us are old enough to remember when it was signed into law in 1863. But it went into effect January 1st of that year, and the word spread all over the country that slavery was no longer legal in the United States. However, most slaves continued to live like slaves because the news didn't really 
wasn't really disseminated too well in the Confederacy, right? So the typical slave's attitude was like this 1864 Alabama slave when asked what he thought about Abraham Lincoln. And he said this, he said, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln except that he set us free. And I don't know nothing to do the right thing. Does it mean like, oh wow, we can do anything we want because all of our sin is paid for. No, it's the spirit enabling power to do the right thing, okay? So anyway, this, this is the status of many Christians. And so we ask, where is our freedom? Where is our joy? Where is our closeness with God and other Christians? Where is our growth? And those are things that Paul was saying, you guys are going to lose these things, or actually you're in the process of losing them in chapter 4, remember? And so our doctrine says one thing, but we frequently do another thing. Um, and uh, that is a big part of what Galatians is about. In fact, all the New Testament, it's like it teaches us doctrinal truth, and then that doctrinal truth is supposed to like penetrate every fiber of our being and sink to the deepest parts of our soul and then change us. And hopefully we're consistent with that. But because we believe in such great truths um, and we're so, we have a lot of, human failings, like I've talked about on Sunday morning with David, great example there, um, we have the capacity or the potential for being really big hypocrites. Okay, So the way to be congruent is to actually understand what you believe and then allow that to come together with your feelings and your behavior. And that's really what a lot of the New Testament writers were doing. They're very cognitive. As a man thinks, so he is. It's Proverbs 23, 7, I think. And so therefore, we have to connect our feelings and our uh, behavior with what we believe. And a lot of Christianity, there's a huge difference between orthodoxy, what we believe, and orthopraxy, what we practice. So let's bring that together. And, bec and when we see it, when we see grace, that grace system, really put into practice, it is really an amazing thing to experience on the giving and receiving end. So, I, when I tell the newcomers classes, I tell them that all the time. I said, well, when we start the class, I said, we believe in grace and truth here, so hopefully you're gonna experience lots of both. Not just truth, and not just kind of a form of grace, because you really have to, for it to be biblical grace, you have to have truth. But, you know, whatever your definition of grace might be, a worldly definition of grace, which means like, oh yeah, just do anything you want because your sins are forgiven anyway. Um, and Paul actually deals with that in a couple sessions from now about that question. Wow, you know, people are, are saying, hey, so if, you teach, if you teach grace, that means people can basically do anything they want. Have you ever heard that? You know, you can do anything you want if you really believe that. And your salvation is secure. Man, you're just like, that's a recipe for immorality, you know. And uh, Paul deals with that in Romans 6 and also in Galatians 5. And he says, may it never be, right? So we know we're, we're on the right track when Paul is defending the stuff that we believe um, <laughs> because it's truth. So our doctrine says one thing, but we do another. Gracious love is in very short supply. What matters to Christ is faith showing itself through love. And that's verse 6. Very key verse, because I call it the, the great pivot here in the book. In chapter 5, we're getting to the where the rubber meets the road, the real practical stuff. Okay, this is all the great theology, but what do we do with it? You know, do we just let it kind of like float in the, the, the room? Or do we actually grab a hold of it and allow it to change us from the inside out? Of course, you know what the answer is. So, God revels in the obedience of his saints who, when their walk matches up with their belief system, um, and they apply it, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, about 200 years ago, one of our well-known encyclopedias, I think it was probably Britannica, discussed the word Adam, the word Adam, A-T-O-M, with the use of only four lines, because we really didn't know a lot about what an Adam was 200 years ago, right? But nonetheless, it was there. But five pages in that encyclopedia were devoted to the word love. Kind of interesting. But in a recent edition of the same encyclopedia, this illustration is about 20 years old, so it's probably going back 20 or 30 years. But in a recent edition of the same encyclopedia, five pages were given to the word Adam, and the, whole, and the word love was omitted in that same encyclopedia. So you can see the way our culture has become maybe a little more scientific, and there's good and bad in that. But grace is in short supply, 
And so as a result of grace, biblical grace, um, God's riches at Christ's expense being in short supply because it's not taught and it's not as applied as it's often as it should be. As a result of grace being in short supply, love is in short supply because grace is the basis for biblical love. All right? So it's got to be an un three, uh, abortion, euthanasia, suicide, abandonment, and rejection are very common in our culture. Children rejecting parents, parents rejecting children, parents rejecting parents. And, you know, there is a clear uh, connection between when cell phones came out, smartphones in particular, I should say, smartphones, when they came out, there was a corresponding increase in teenage girl suicide. And why is that? Well, that's, they say it's because that's when social media came about and girls just do girl things. They start comparing themselves to other girls, right? And so there's always somebody better looking, there's always, always somebody smarter, there's always somebody more popular. And so there you start seeing the canary in the cave and you start seeing some breakdown even with teenage girls. So that's why we have to go to Galatians 5, 2 through 6 to see the basis of how God's gracious love and how he accepts us affects our interpersonal relationships with family, friends, and co-workers. Faith brings righteousness, but legalism brings alienation. Faith brings righteousness, but legalism or self-effort brings alienation. That's the natural corresponding result to those two belief systems, okay? Good doctrine shows itself in love. It has to show itself in love. Otherwise, faith of that works is dead, right? It doesn't have a result. And so, Paul defends himself in chapters 1 and 2. Remember that? That's he's defending his apostleship, um, defense of his apostleship. And then in chapters 3 and 4, he defends grace through faith. And now in 5, he begins to elaborate on the duty of the Christian, um, what it means to us is an everyday basis that we've been redeemed by the blood through a free gift. So in verse 1, uh, who'd like to read verses 1 through 4 out loud? Any takers? Oh yeah, and also please look up these verses too. After we read verses 1 through 4. By the way, I'm really excited because I can actually see now. I have my lens replaced on Monday morning. So this is like a mind blower. I don't have to like read things like this anymore. I can actually read even without reading glasses. I'm still going to use reading glasses, but I can see distance better now, not perfectly, but so I'm really happy about that. God showed me his grace <laughs> by having a doctor take out my old lens and insert a man-made one. So I am part cyborg now. <laughs> so who'd like to read verses 1 through 4? <laughs> Galatians 5, 1 through 4. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Behold I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Okay, great. Thank you, George. So verses one through four, he's basically still on this comparison mode here between the law system and the grace system. And he says, anyone who thinks he can reach communion with God, connection with God through rituals, like baptism, circumcision, or the mass, or anything else, has to go in it all the way. And they have to do it perfectly. Who has James 2.10? Anybody read, have that? James 2.10. Just read it out when you get it. But whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Yeah. So you can do it through this system. It's just that you have to be absolutely perfect, right? Um, and no one's going to do that, except for, of course, Jesus did it perfectly. So I remember uh, a long time ago when I was doing evangelism at a flea market in Southlake, flea market which no longer exists. I think they're 
million dollar homes there now. <laughs> but there used to be a flea market in South Lake, believe it or not, near White's Chapel. And so I used to go there every week with different people from my previous church and we would do evangelism. We actually had like a little booth and things like that. And we would talk to people, hand out tracts, and it was kind of fun. So we got to talk to people who were coming from various uh, spiritual backgrounds. And one day I spoke to a guy who was a Jehovah's Witness and his, his name was Jack. And Jack actually might be watching us right now, but anyway, um, he, uh, he insisted that it was by faith and works that we're saved. Okay, and I remember this discussion because uh, and because I said to him, "Well, tell me how, what what are the percentages? Like, can you tell me how much is like my effort, or better yet, your effort? Because I don't really believe this. So, talk about yourself. How much is it is your effort, and how much effort is it of Christ's? And I said, if you're going to tell people that, you really need to know what proportion, you know. So I said, if it, is it 99 to one? Is it 50-50, what is it, you know? And if it's, and if it, if it is, if it's 50% or if it's 90% that you're doing, why not 100%? And if it's 100%, then Christ didn't need to die. Right? Because you're, you're taking care of all of it. And so why did Christ die then? Why did he, why did he bother? So if we could save ourselves partly, then why didn't God just allow us to save ourselves completely? But Christ paid the whole price for our salvation and we know that because in Hebrews 10.10 10, among other places in fact it's you could actually pick out several different verses in Hebrews to prove this that by and by the, that will we have made been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all so Christ is the one who made us righteous his righteousness is imputed or projected onto us or put in our account for you accountant types George, right? So, um, what is it? Uh, oh, and then verse 4, look what verse 4 says. Uh, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. And this word alienation or alienate there um, is the Greek word katargethete. And you, you might think at first, wow, it sounds like he's saying that the Galatians are losing their salvation. But actually what's happening here is uh, he's saying the effect of going back to the grace, or to the law system from the grace system once you have been saved. And a good, the King James has a good translation of this. It says, Christ uh, is become of no effect to you or no effect on you. It's kind of like you're living in a sphere where Christ is not operating, where he's not active. And that is exactly what the law system is. So it doesn't mean to cut off. It doesn't mean to permanently disconnect. It simply means to reduce to inactivity or to be non-active. So if you go back to the law system, Christ is not going to be working in your life. He's not going to change you because it's all about self-effort in the other system. And so, so you're basically trying to sanctify yourself. You're not depending upon the Holy Spirit to be transformed or to change. You're going back to the, the law system. So um, here is, I think, a good, maybe a good way to look at this summary for the first four verses. So each system, law or grace, stands on its own. Going to the law system separates one from the benefits of Christ. So it's like I'm saved by grace through faith, and then I decide to go live a real legalistic lifestyle. And um, all, like the gray areas of life are become black and white. Um, I move away from forgiving people. I demand performance from other people. And it shows that that wrong belief system shows itself in my relationships. All right. So it becomes very conditional. Um, it becomes very rigid uh, because that's what the Mosaic law was. It was a very rigid, external system. It was the system of self-effort. It was the way of Hagar, not the way of Sarah. Okay. So um, each system, law or grace, one or the other, stands on its own. If you want to, if you want to try to live the Christian life through the law system, you have to do it perfectly. But going to the law system separates one from the benefits of Christ. It alienates you from the sphere where Christ is working, where he's 
diligently trying to change you through scripture, through experiences, from significant relationships, people who are going to influence you in the right way. Because what you're doing is you're putting up your shield against God's grace. I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my own way, God. I want to live a system of religion and not of relationship. And again, contrast again, so you know what we're talking about. These are all, I showed you this, I think, three weeks, three or four weeks ago, and didn't camp out on the specifics here, but I, I want to starkly show the contrast between these two systems and see how we can also be vulnerable to it in the year 2021 and not just um, some people in Galatia some 2,000 years ago. So these are some of the stark contrasts. So I'll, I'll go back to that in a minute, but um, I want to uh, ask you these questions for discussion. But first, you wanted to say something about circumcision, right? Um, well, it was, it was actually uh, verse 6. Verse six. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, Naveen. So what does that mean that if you accept circumcision, the of no advantage to you? Does that mean that if you go back to the tradition or the custom ways, which they are following, I don't want to say the word you will be losing salvation, but what does that exactly mean? Like not blend it. Right, when, the, when Paul went to Galatia, he taught them, good question, when Paul went to Galatia, he taught them about that we're saved by grace through faith alone, and he wanted to the, the um, Galatians to continue to live in that that system, that we're not just saved by grace, but we're also sanctified by grace. So, uh, meaning we have to depend upon what God is doing and not our own effort. But what happened is that there were a bunch of false teachers who came in after Paul, and they started teaching, okay, we're Jewish, some of you are Jewish, but if you really want to be a Christian, you have to be a Jew first. And, and, and that made a lot of sense to them, because most people in the ancient Near Eastern world, when they heard of Christianity, they saw it as a sect, S-E-C-T, of Judaism. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so if you really want to be a Christian, what you have to do is become a Jew. And what, how do you become a Jew? You become, the men become circumcised. Everybody lives according to the 613 laws of the Old Testament. You go back to sacrifices and things like that. And Judaism was a very attractive thing, too, because Judaism stood alone as a system of morality in stark contrast to the Greek-Roman world, which was very immoral. So there was a lot of attractiveness there. We look, we look at it and say, oh, man, I'm not going to live according to those crazy i got to sacrifice animals and live according to these crazy laws. It's not as attractive to us, but we have our own forms of legalism. And um, in terms of rigidity and treating people conditional ways, not being forgiven, that's what some of the ways it shows itself. I did my doctoral dissertation on cult-like churches, and they were basically, I wouldn't say they were... You know, they weren't Jewish or anything, but they were just as rigid and harsh as the Jewish system was. Does, does that help? So it's going back, it's basically, okay, you're, they're becoming Jews. They're believing, um, wow, to be a Christian, I have to be a Jew first. I think also on the side of it, like where Christ is no effect to you, is when you're operating in a legalism world, we, we talked about, I think, a couple weeks ago, um, it doesn't put God in the correct spot in your life, right? You're you're independent of God, so it puts you're focused on what I need to do, what others need to do, what everybody should be doing instead of putting God first. And so you're hurting your growth there. The the things that Christ could teach you and you can you can experience it, Christ's love from because you're focused on yourself and what you're doing need to do. You're missing out on what you could be learning from Christ and how he could be transforming your life. Yes, it really does reinforce selfishness and mm -hmm. self-centeredness. Is that kind of yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, there's no, nothing good about it. Um, just, to, just so you can kind of um, make a cultural bridge because we are thinking, um, oh, Judaism, but I'm trying to think of like our version of that. You know, so uh, on this chart that I've handed out before. It would be lifestyle legalism. So some characteristics, for example, would be um, 
that they see gray area issues as black and white. In other words, like things like moderate drinking, gambling, dancing, things like that. Um, you can still believe that those things are wrong for you, but they're kind of gray. Those there's some examples in in scripture. So Christian, Christians do them or not, and we impose that on every Christian. If you if you do these things, then you're automatically not a Christian, or you're a really really weak baby Christian, or a reprobate Christian, um, believes that certain choices are necessary for all Christians, like schooling choices, certain clothing, hairstyles, adornment, or Bible version choice. <laughs> you know, or sometimes we, if, I, I love the King James, okay, I love the King James version, but it's, it's not the divinely inspired one. Those were the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that were divinely inspired, but some people believe that. So that's, that's uh, you have to be a certain way in order to be a sanctified and obedient believer. But it's even bigger than that. It would be like just being rigid with other people, non-forgiving, um, judgmental uh, in a very harsh way. Um, and you guys could probably think of some more examples. So I'm trying to take what was legalistic then and give our version of it, you know. So that way we know some things to avoid. All, a lot of the attitudes are the same. Right. So, any thoughts on some of the questions here, or any other questions you might have, or comments? Uh, review how religion, and again, I'm thinking, so, for for example, some of these things, and I'll put that slide back up in a second. But review how religion stunts God's blessings. When did you realize the difference between law and grace in your own life? Like. We had uh, recently at this church, I don't want to get into details, but a person uh, said, I finally get it. A light went on that I'm rejecting works salvation, that it is totally through the work of Christ. That happened very recently in our church. And I was like, so happy to hear that. So when was that, when did that switch go off for you as opposed to seeing religion versus a relationship through Christ by grace. When did you realize the difference between law and grace and then also what difference did it make in your life? So. What do you got? Thoughts, observations, experiences, questions, debates, <laughs> pleadings, <laughs> offerings, thoughts. For me, um, when one of my friends, who was basically Christian background, but no knowledge of the Bible and well, I'm doing an immoral life in my standard, and I saw him change one day by attending a meeting and accepting Christ, hmm. and I thought there is something more, there is truth in something more than what I believe in also faith plus work. So that's why when we came, I realized the world about Christ in the truth, the way of life. Mm. So the change in the life of my friend in Southern children one day, he, he, he stopped drinking, gambling, and, and smoking, everything, the sexual immorality, everything he stopped in one day, that's the change. Mm. And this was this was before you understood it, or after you yeah, had it? Uh, before I understood it, there is a, there is something beyond uh, what I believe in. Wow. The early moral character and you know, faith in Christ, but plus you have to do many things, a lot of things in life to say that you're a Christian or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a lot of. Uh, Lifestyle changes life change, life change. based upon that difference in belief. Yes, and uh, he just believed in Christ, accepted Christ, and one day came hmm. That's great because normally it's like a there's like a big transition. It takes sometimes years to for people to change. Yeah, you know? like I remember um, Norma Jane McCorvey. You know, she was the um, involved in the Roe v. Wade decision. She, she was pregnant and then that's 
she wanted to have an abortion, although she never did have wind up having an abortion. In fact, her daughter, who's now like what 48 years old, she just revealed herself a few weeks ago who she is. But anyway, Norma J. McCorvey, she was she she was a woman who was very you know didn't you know was not a friend of God, put it that way, and. Um, she was a person who lived a very rough lifestyle. She was also a lesbian and so on. And then one day, about 20 years ago, she trusted in Christ as her savior. Ironically, the guy who led Operation Rescue led her to Christ. <laughs> and, and she, she um, trusted in Christ as her savior, but she was still a lesbian. But then she realized after a couple of years that lesbianism was opposite of God's plan for us. And so she rejected lesbianism. But she still thought abortion was okay. But then a few years went by and she eventually changed her view on abortion too. So sanctification usually takes time. It doesn't always happen, but that's your your friend's example is powerful because it like bam made a huge difference, you know. But she was also faithfully discipled too. People were always, you know, trying to interact with her and praying for her. So that was a big benefit. Anybody else have any time in their life when they had a big change or saw a big change in someone else's life and realized, hey, you know, it's not by our own effort and we reject religion? Because that's the, I mean, you know, biblical Christianity is really the only belief system, faith in world history that says that we're saved freely. That every other system they have different details in the in the answers, different nuances and so on. Different rituals, different offerings or obligations to, in order to get God to like you again. Um, but nonetheless, they're all the same in that they're by works. And sometimes plus faith. But biblical Christianity is the only one that says that God himself came to save you and offer and paid for salvation himself through his son and that it's only by dependence or faith or trust in him that we can be reconnected back to God and be forgiven and have righteousness. It's the only one. That's why like I just that itself the some of the uniquenesses of Christianity um, is very stark and um, attractive um, and so if you look at this chart here all the others are just religion. They're all the way of the Tower of Babel. You know, we'll, we'll get back to God ourselves. We'll get to the heavens ourselves through our own means. But the way of relationship is the one that's based on truth, but it's also very efficacious. It is effective. It does the job. It's the only one. So we need to know that, that that is a very great uniqueness of Christianity. But anybody else have any thoughts or questions or experiences of when you kind of like realize this for yourself, that um, the way of grace through faith is the right way as opposed to the way of the religion that maybe you were raised with or that you were taught or that you heard about as an adult? Any observations or experiences? I think the compartmentalization which you mentioned the last one, I think that's very normal among most people. They segregate church life versus your other life separately. Oh yeah. So technically you are under the law during five days and then you change <laughs> to be under the grace for the next two days with the church activities and then you go back. That's very true. I thought about how I was I was raised. I, I grew up in a Bible church too. It was a very legalistic Bible church, but um, it was like I was just like, oh, it's just a part of your life, and that's the way my whole f most most you know people are this way. I think I'm not like getting you know negative on my family or anything because most Americans, most Christians in the world are like this, where it's kind of like, okay, you have your you go to church, but then that's over there, and then you just go back into the same rut as before and you don't allow your faith to um, determine or rule the rest of the week like you were saying to me yeah
guess for me, uh, it's kind of the, the inverse for my realization. Um, you know, one of the things that you grow, grew up in, like a Bible church, I grew up as a missionary kid, and so during my formative years, were my parents going through missionary training, and so it was. Uh, um, I wouldn't say it was legalism based based on uh, their salvation. It was more like, hey, we need to behave this way so we don't lead others astray. Mm -hmm. And so they were strict for that reason, which I think is kind of appropriate if you're going to be in a missionary lifestyle and, and you're going to cultures that don't can misunderstand things really easily. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I went from there, uh, after when I graduated high school, I joined the Marine Corps. And so I went from a very um, strict Christian world, like it was, it was very closed off because uh, nobody had a TV, everybody worked on campus, everybody um, you know, we're putting in efforts to there, so it was literally seven days a week, 24 hours a day, focused on mm. on God. And then going from there to the Marine Corps, which in a lot of ways there was a good experience for the Marine Corps. There's a lot of good things that I got from but at the same time, it was also a very worldly place to, to step in. It was extreme A to ex to the opposite, you know, 180 degrees opposite. And so there was a lot of performance-based stuff in the Marines and performance-based, you know, you have to do this, you have to be in the top, you know, 10% in order to get promoted. You have to do this, that, that. So it was very works-focused. Mm. And, you know, that threw me a little bit out of whack, but, you know, just realizing at one point that I couldn't do it, like, I couldn't do religion through my own efforts. There was a big clicking moment where it's just like, I have to be dependent on God to, to make this this work and that was a big kind of turning point so and so that that was kind of my it took a lot to to come back after after that so so how did what did that look like in your life in terms of how did you depend upon God um I think one of the, the points where I came back and I had first moved here to Texas and I was uh really in a tight spot and the church actually, there were some members of the church that gave me a car, and I remember that first day that I drove up to work with the car, and for that whole, like, next month, I never talked about God so much in my my life as when they saw that, and then it just really, it was like, here I am trying to be good and, like, dependent, and it's, it's just not working, doing everything my way, then all of a sudden something that has nothing to do with me, and I'm talking about it, and that was kind of like, Oh, okay. Mm. I got to be a little more dependent. I got. I can't force things in it. Um, and just taking that and applying it to other areas is like not trying mm. to force it, and really just being dependent on God. I guess so. See, so you live by faith. Mm -hmm. You walked in faith. Yeah, because yeah, it was just really amazing that provision like that. What it was really turned out to be was just kind of an opportunity for people to ask me about God and. Because they were just, their minds were blown that somebody actually gave me a car. I mean, everybody was just, because uh, at the time I was talking vending machines, and so just literally spending all day talking to a guy about it. And, um, yeah, it was really cool. So, and it had nothing to do with me. So that was a, I think that was really the, that moment, because it was just like, oh, okay, because mm -hmm. I really needed that. <laughs> but at the same time, it was used for something. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, why we are blessed so we can but yeah it was it was kind of twofold there so, cool yeah anybody else have any experiences about their walk and where the kind of the light bulb went off and maybe you were saved already but it was like wow this really is by grace through faith it's not through my effort the effort I put in is is um, you know walking in faith but I'm really just uh walking through this life without certainties that are formed by me but by God's provisions that he'll give to me through his grace. Anybody have any thoughts? So I don't have a personal one that I can think of but uh, I know experience adjacent. So my brother uh, strong believer but there was a period in college where he uh, had graduated at this point he was still in college decided he was going to follow the law. 
Texas or like Galatians in 2020. Um, but we're working on that And so he would, you know, he was meeting bacon and uh, it was resting on the Sabbath and at that point they like classes because they were doing some work, but different discussion. Um, so anyway, my parents and him got into it and kind of drove a little bit of a rift there for a while, but, uh, you know, from the outside looking in, you able to see like, oh, like he, I know he's a believer and I know he's read these things that you don't have to follow all the rules anymore, but he's still um, needing structure, trying to like perform in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we walked through it and we walked through relations quite a bit. Eventually he's moved away from doing all the legalistic Old Testament laws, but I think there's still probably some lingering Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a a direct uh, example of that. We, I know there's some folks out in our, at Bear Creek who went through a phase like that of where, oh wow, I just love Jewish history and Jewish culture, and maybe maybe we should go back to living according to the law, and they forget a, a, the whole rest of the New Testament. I'm <laughs> like, and of course that that was past tense for them. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's the direct, like, way of Jewish life uh, well, according there, to the law. But yeah, the because outside, like, there's confusion. If you know, that's the, the teaching is like you don't follow the Old Testament; we've been saved by grace. Um, when I see someone operating like that, regardless of the personal motivation, you know, I, I guess it's confusing for me, and it could be confusing for others to look at that as well and say, "Oh." Well, if I want to be like you as a Christian, like, then that's the things I need to do. Yeah. And that's not the case. Yeah. That's for you. Well, what, what's the attractiveness of, like, why do you think people are drawn to living, uh, like, you know, uh, they would be basically messianic, messianic Jews, but not believing in grace through faith, but some form of modern day Judaism. Maybe for the common theology, they believe that Christianity is an extension of Judaism now. So they have to have a Christian belief. They have to be a Christian belief. Yeah, but, but why, why, why do they, uh, what's the attraction of that? Um, like, what do you think your brother was drawn to that simply because he thought it was true or are there other cultural attractions? I think my impression was that he needed some structure <laughs> and so having like don't eat this, eat that, work on this day, don't work on that day was helpful. Um, but it gets kind of mixed into the religious aspect and the spiritual aspect. Uh, I think at one point the phrase was like and the Spirit's enabling me to, to do these things, uh, which kind of still lends itself to a performance-based, even through a Spirit-led operation. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think you're on to something there, like with the um, people like structure. And I, and I think that in these days, too, uh, there's a lot, the church has become very shallow and um, superficial. And so I think that, it's particularly the church in America, and it's only getting more that way. And then we, but we live in a culture that is very uh, broken apart and disorganized. And like I've said many times, we're like kind of in a spiritual fog, and things are just all upended. And so when you when you can see a system like that that has clear rules and regulations, there's an attraction there. It's like, wow, that's something that I can, I don't have to really think myself, I don't have to think, I can just delegate my spiritual life to this system. And if there's one thing we don't like to do, and I'm the chief offender here, is think. Thinking is is like really hard work. <laughs> so I just have, I just would rather have it to where I can just go by road and coast. Dick Taylor, were you oh. going to say something? Oh, sorry. I'm just agreeing with you. I, oh. I think that's one of the motivations, like you said. Mm-hmm. I have to think about it. Like I can think about times where I was in very rigorous programs like music school. I just got better. It wasn't because I was really 
working that hard. I just followed along with everybody else. And <clears throat> at the end of four years, I was a whole lot better. But then when I was on my own, you know, settled back into old habits and my weaknesses. Yeah. yeah. Like even when I put together a, like a, a sermon or a study like this, it's like the easy parts where I don't have to think. I like doing that first, like making the slides and all that. It's like, it's like I don't have to think because I just have to type what I've already written out. But then when I have to actually think and study, it's hard work. I think there's also I think my a brain hurt. There's another side to legalism too. Yeah. Uh, that there's an instinct in some people to have a penance period where they want to follow these rigid rules as a, as a penance. Mm. So, um, like, you know, there, there's people that will take long trips or on their knees, those kind of things like mm -hmm. that. And sometimes strict advance to regulations, asceticism, living in a mountain, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I like the penance aspect. Good point. Very much. Mm -hmm. Just, I'm sorry. Well, another part of the attraction that I mean, it was like while you were doing the strict discipline, you got better. So it's like I think there's a there's also a desire to have a formula or a if I do X, I get this outcome. So you can kind of like go and uh, mm -hmm. have your own tailor made result, so mm -hmm. to speak. And you know, if I so if I follow, um, just maybe use an example like certain. Um, Denomination religions may have a, a saint that you pray to to get a specific outcome, or they may, if you do X, Y, and Z, um, you'll be forgiven of this sin, or um, you know whatever it may may be is just that having that formula that you can pick up and go, okay, I don't have to worry about this anymore because I checked all the boxes off, so I know I'm going to get this result, or and um, that's kind of a I guess an attraction to it is like, oh, I can guarantee this. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason why, like, maybe the prosperity gospel might be a little prop, um, mm -hmm. popular as well. Is there's certain little actions that they can expect to get. Yeah, and there's a payoff at the end too. Right, right to get yeah. that payoff. Like, how do I get to that payoff? <laughs> or um, just systems and everything. Like, even I remember when I was in sales, they just say, you know, just figure out how many people you have to talk to to get that yes. And so then it became about. Did I talk to 100 people today? Not did I make a sale or not? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. And so it's just following that to get an outcome. Okay. Um, or in sports, you can say, hey, if I just practice hard enough, or or whatever it may be, they say, you, you know, you hear that, you can spend 10,000 hours at something mm -hmm. to become a master of it. Right. Like that formula is there in everything we do. Mm -hmm. um, Good. All right, let's, let's go ahead, Naveen. So, uh, no, I was I think that structure is there by default in our life. Yes. Because we go to work, we need to finish certain things and come also. By default, you are getting used to a structure. And then again, that compartmentalization comes in my mind. Because mm -hmm. five days you are used to that one kind of way, clock in, clock out, or check in, check out. Then, mm -hmm. then you Sunday becomes effective. Not structured, you are like, oh, uh, kind of thing. So I think that understanding of that word free uh, is different when it comes to spiritual realm versus your natural life, which you do Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that free, how you take that concept of freedom in Christ and put it in your work life and how that sets you free is difficult to you know, realize. So you see that the majority of your time is you are under that structure then you will be the structure. Yes. Alright. And that's the dilemma. Big time. And uh, yeah, so this, this, the rest of this uh, passage today, as well as more into chapter five, shows us where the rubber meets the road. The one of the, and then later on in a couple of weeks, we'll see how the system of grace, which one of the criticisms against it, is that it does not um, influence and create a morality, it, morality, 
It doesn't. It's just all loosey goosey, and you can do what you want, and because you, you're going to be forgiven anyway. But actually, the system of grace produces a higher degree of effective morality because it changes us from the inside out. And we'll talk more about that too. We talked about that a little bit in chapter two, but um, so it actually has a higher standard than the system of, of uh, the law. Um, kind of interesting. All right, so let, let me um, continue to bring this home a little bit here. So the one who lives by self-effort, um, who trusts in his own way, uh, is alienated from the work of Christ. They're actually dissociating themselves to a degree, except for the justification part. I'll take that, God. But the rest of it, I can handle on from here on in myself. And... Um, so um, they're going to be alienated from the active work of Christ. That's what the alienation factor comes into. It's not that they're alienated from Christ or from their relationship with Christ, but they're alienated from the active working and fellowship of Christ. All right. So um, a person in grace is secure. That's a, that's another big advantage of the grace system is that there's security there because not only is our salvation won by grace through faith, but it's also maintained by grace through faith. Huge. Um, and so we not only have eternal security, but we also have the subjective understanding of that eternal security, which is assurance of salvation. So the Bible says that if a person places their faith alone in Christ alone for the forgiveness of the sin, they're saved. But then how do I know that I'm saved? And this system would include a belief and assurance that I can also, these things I've written to you so you know you are saved, John says. So a person is secure. Um, he's in the righteous right hand of our Savior. A legalist is bogged down in insecurity. He doesn't know how much he has to do in order to satisfy the divine standard. Not only is he alienated from warm fellowship with Christ, but also, as a consequence, he is going to be put in a position of being alienated from warm fellowship with people. So grace is at the, the a lack of grace is at the uh, foundation of poor human relationships as well. That's the beauty of this passage that we're looking at. We're doing the great pivot. We're pivoting from the vertical to the horizontal. So we're actually taking this theology and putting feet on it, or rather seeing that it already does have feet, and that it really changes us. It gives us a totally different perspective in um, human relationships. So because legalism leads to conditional, incomplete love with our spouses, with our children, with our friends and our coworkers, is our love distorted and contorted because we don't like their beliefs, their priorities, their goals, their race, their hairstyle, their work ethic, their priorities, whatever it might be. And so do we reject them as a result of that? So what message do we send? Um, after all, Christians are automatically great at being rigid anyway. You know, we have, <laughs> we, we, we have kind of a lot of hang-ups to begin with, and so we're just adding more hang-ups onto that. So, but Paul says, this has got to be rooted out, folks. Look what he says in chapter 4, verse 30. Um, he says there, But what can the, what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. These two systems are mutually exclusive. Trying to morph them and put them together is like taking a round peg and jamming it into a square hole. It just doesn't work. So you've got to get rid of the slave woman's son. That comparison of chapter 4 verses 21 to 31 between um, uh, Hagar and Isaac. Right. So legalism, that's what it leads to. Uh, it's got to be rooted out. Otherwise it'll smother and kill. It's poisonous to the body of Christ. And the legalist is the one who is alienated and shut out. Um, so then, the one who is saved by grace is not only free, but he also has the capacity to be close with other people because he's close with Christ through dependence, continual dependence, and walking and abiding in faith uh, with Christ because he knows he has to. It's not saying, oh, thanks for the justification and I'll do the sanctification from now on. But he's abiding with Christ 
and walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, right? Um, so it's a very active, intentional thing. It's not just by automatic rote. And it requires, it requires attention, it requires thinking, it requires praying, it requires depending, like you guys have talked about. So, let's look at the last two verses. Who'd like to read those two verses out loud? Verses 5 and 6 of chapter 5. Again, so, for we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Good. All right. So you had something you wanted to say about circumcision. May well say you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so. My question here would be, you know, to everybody just hear people's thoughts on it is what's the difference between faith by works is, without works is dead, and legalism? Hmm. And so I thought that would just be a good kind of talking point. Yeah. So if anybody got any thoughts? The difference between faith by works, for faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. And legalism. And, the, and, and like um, the legalism we're talking about here, like lifestyle legalism. Right. Okay, self-effort, so on. Okay. I'm just wondering if anybody had any thoughts on those. Hmm. I'll, I'll throw something out okay. on that, just in relation to this topic versus mm -hmm. the theology of that versus <laughs> Paul, and without going into all, 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 of, all of that, but I, I, I think uh, in, in, a, in a significant way, uh, legalism is forcing you to do something. Right? Mm -hmm. My works according to my faith is what I want to do because of my faith and how I want to give back and show love. Mm. It, it's, it's internally focused. Legalism tends to be, you gotta do it, you gotta do it, you gotta do it, and people, oh, I gotta do it too, but we have to do it. It's, a, it's an externally forced thing on you versus an internally desired thing. Mm -hmm. to do. But both are works. Mm -hmm. It's the motive behind it, I think, makes mm -hmm. a difference. No, well, that's a good point. Um, I think one of the things that I always heard is like, uh, you know, you do things to please God because you love Him. And that's where your obedience comes, is not because you have to do it, but because you want to show Him love Him. Just like the things I get for my wife are, are a little extra special, and I go out of my way to do it because I want to show her love. Whereas, you know, th th there's just a there's a difference between that and just other things. I mean, it's yeah, when you do it because you want to do it, that's. But mm. then when you tell your kids they have to do it, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's legalism. <laughs> yep. You, 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 you turn the corner from a works by love and faith to legalism because now you you want to take that same thing that you think is good and make everybody else do it. And that's how we turn the corner well, on it. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Or? Yeah. No, I think it was a good song. So. In verses 5 and 6, uh, or let's look at verse 5 again. It says, But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit, the righteousness for which we hope. Okay, so it's like righteousness is the thing that you and I need more than anything else. We need to be made right. We need to be justified before God. And, of course, the works system would say, okay, you have to work to become righteous. You've got to do it yourself. You've got to prove it. You've got to do the work that it takes. But the grace system says what? Who'd like to look at? Who'd like to read Romans five eighteen through nineteen? Anybody? Whoever gets it first, read it out. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as th 
through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Yes, that's, that's the build up, that's the goal, that's the thing that we all crave. And that's, the, in one word, that's what the book of Romans is about. If you ever had to summarize Romans, just say righteousness. That's, it's the thing that we need. And I mean, we call it salvation sometimes, salvation from hell. But it's more than not getting the bad thing, it's getting the good stuff too, which is righteousness, which is a new identity in Christ, which is the, um, the Holy Spirit, gaining the Holy Spirit, um, having a new identity, uh, being placed in the body of Christ. All these ble great blessings are given to us. Having eternal life, of course, that's a biggie, <laughs> right? So righteousness, where does it come from? It doesn't come from our works, although that is the falsehood of legalism, especially salvation legalism, that you're saved by your own works. And you know, like, like James said and Paul quoted, or Paul at least gave the same idea, that if you're going to do that, you've got to do it perfectly because God's standard is perfection, right? And it, not anything less than that because he's a holy and righteous God. So how do we get to that standard of righteousness? Well, we have to um, trust in Christ in order to have his righteousness be projected or imputed onto us because in this life we don't really technically become righteous. Christ's righteousness is put in our account. So when God the Father sees us, he doesn't see us as we once were. He sees us as he sees his son Christ. So um, a theologian was talking to a group of seminary students one day and he said um, I asked a series of questions to them. How many of you, I asked, are as righteous and acceptable in the sight of God as I am? Every hand in the auditorium was raised. How many of you, I asked again, are as righteous and acceptable in the sight of God as Billy Graham? And this is before Billy Graham was went to be with the Lord. Okay, so Billy Graham in his pre-glorified form. This time about half the audience raised their hands. How many of you are as acceptable and righteous in the sight of God as the Apostle Paul? He's just ramping it up, right? There were, as about, there were about 10% of the hands raised. Now here's a really tough one. I said, how many of you in the sight of God, God are, as, are as righteous and acceptable as who? Jesus, Jesus right. Only three hands were raised out of an entire auditorium of seminary students. And so what's the right answer? Yeah, we're, we're actually, in the eyes of God the Father, we, because the righteousness of Christ is put into our account, that is how righteous we are in his eyes, which is a mind blower. Okay. And that's positional righteousness. Of course, it's not practical righteousness, but hopefully in this life we're going to make some good progress in our, righteous, our practical righteousness. It's not going to be perfect, but we're going to make some good headway there. So we are as right in the eyes of God the Father. We are Otherwise, we're, otherwise could we be led into heaven? <laughs> no. No, we don't have a chance of a snowball in whatever <laughs> to get into heaven, right? So um, the, the multitude of blessings and benefits of grace are awesome. So there are all the emotional outpourings of chapter 4, our joy. You guys are losing your joy. Intimacy. You guys are losing your closeness with God. Freedom or liberty. You guys are losing the spirit-enabling power to do the right thing. You're just blowing it, guys. You're not growing in Christ. You're losing your capacity for growth. So we have to continue to multiply into hope and righteousness. So we have that hope. And you know in the Bible, when, especially in the New Testament, when it talks about hope, it doesn't mean, oh, I hope I get pizza for lunch. It's like when it talks about hope, it says you have the hope of righteousness. That means it's, you're going to get it. It's like a certain thing. It's not just a possibility. Different view of hope between the New Testament and the way we see it in the English language. So it, this, this, um, it oozes and pours out of us. And uh, ritual or lack of ritual, um, circumcision, liturgy, infant baptism, whatever it might be, whatever, uh, adult baptism, what is the thing that we're looking for? What is important, it, what import is important is faith. 
Okay, now we're looking at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision has any value. Doesn't make any difference. Um, the only thing that counts is faith. And here it, I think he's referring, in, in the New Testament too, you can see faith as, like, I, I have faith in this chair that it's holding me up, like an act of faith, I'm trusting it. But then also faith could be used as your doctrine, what you believe in. Like, you know, we use the same use difference, difference in English as the Greek language does. So sometimes you talk about your faith, you're referring to your body of doctrine. And I think that's also what James is referring to in James 2. Mm -hmm. It's like faith that works is dead. Meaning you can have the best doctrine in the world, but if you make stupid decisions, you're not going to be saved from natural consequences. And James also has a very proverbial view of, of, um, of works. Uh, to your faith without works is, is dead. So it's not your, your bad choices are, are um, not going to, or your, your good doctrine is not going to help you if you have right doctrine but make bad choices. You're still going to suffer the natural consequences. And the death there is not eternal death, but death in terms of this life. So what's important is your faith, the basis of all of our doctrine, showing itself in love. Vertical, horizontal. Bam! You got the big pivot. Just took place. All up to four and a half, four and a half chapters, all about vertical, vertical, vertical for the most part. And now he's like, for the rest of the book, it's going to be horizontal. We're talking about human relationships now. So, so you're is love showing itself through doctrine? Think about all of our major doctrines, just the basic stuff like God, um, the Bible, Christ, and salvation. They're all deeply embedded in love. It's not just a, a distant theology that's floating around in the, the ethereal air, but it is real meaty doctrine that is embedded, that is drenched in love. So think about theology proper, the Trinity the Godhead. That's basic, very basic theology. And that relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit is the only perfect relationship that's ever existed. And they, they've always loved each other. Perfectly. Love has always existed. Because God's always existed. The Bible. God communicated to us and loved us enough to communicate with us. And so he gave us this body of knowledge which is a tremendous gift, gift, and it has not been tainted by the fall. All right, in its original writings, it has not been. So there, it's like the one thing that we have that we can trust in terms of our truth source. So it's it's given to us in love. He lovingly communicates. Some people have said, like Larry Crabb, one of my heroes, said I wrote a book. I watched his funeral service the other day, and it. Before he died, of course, they asked him, what's your favorite book of all the books you've written? And he, and he said, my favorite book, he's written probably 50 books, um, my favorite book is 66 Love Letters. He wrote a commentary on the whole Bible. And each one is a love letter, he said. So the Bible is drenched in love. Christ um, is nothing short of pure love himself. And the reason why he, that God sent him was because of love, right? It wasn't because we were so lovely. It was simply because he was loving out of, out of his character of love. If he was loved, if he, if he loved us on the basis of our goodness, there wouldn't be very much there. <laughs> but he loved us on the basis of his character. Um, and then salvation, and that is motivated in love, of course. So, love is uh, not just being nice, it also involves other qualities, too. I want to read you this um, short story here between, uh, I think it's a father and a son, to show you the difference between, like, love and um, other qualities. So it's love is not just being nice. All right, so this, this author, I can't remember his name right now, but anyway, he's, he wrote, We had a long, profitable discussion about work, the business world, and interviewing, and he did seem to be perking up. This was, I think, his son. We went on to talk about other things and enjoyed a good time of just being together. As our conversation was winding down, Bobby said, Dad, thanks a lot for your time. I really was getting down on myself, but you've helped a lot. 
You know, he said, one thing I've always known is that you love me. I've never doubted it. You've shown me that in all kinds of love. I was naturally pleased to hear that, but somehow it didn't seem complete. Again, this is between a father and a son. I pondered for a few seconds, then God seemed to put a new thought in my mind. Bobby, I really do love you. Always have and always will. But let me ask you this question. Have you always known that I accept you? And Bobby seemed taken aback. He asked, what do you mean? I mean there's a difference between love and acceptance. You say you're confident that I love you, but acceptance is something else. Do you know, for example, that I accept you just like you are, that I really like you? Huge difference between love and liking, too, by the way. Yeah. We're, we're called to love people, but authentically, I don't think I can like everybody, but I am called to like them, which means that I'm looking out for their highest good, but that doesn't mean that they all have to be my best friend, right? But we're called to love, right? So anyway, back to Bobby and his father. Um, Bobby thought for a few moments after his father said, do you know that I really like you? Then in a serious tone, he said, no, Dad, I guess I really don't. I don't think I have really felt that you accept me, meaning you like me. I asked him to tell me about it. He continued, I guess I always felt that you would like me if I was more spiritual, you know, if I read my Bible more or did more Christian activities or maybe went into full-time Christian work like you did instead of going into business. So, okay, here we're actually applying it. Okay, we are, we are called to love. Um, but maybe we can like more people than we actually like, like maybe our family, uh, which is difficult, difficult sometimes. So we're talking about stuff that's very, very immensely practical. So having a greater capacity for God's grace and staying in that system uh, is the necessary prerequisite foundation to be able to live like this. Because verse 6 says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's the, he says it's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that counts. Otherwise, you're like a clanging gong and a noisy cymbal. Um, otherwise, it's dead. It doesn't do anything. It's not effective. It doesn't change things. You don't look different than a pagan looks. So the truth of our doctrine is lived out by the impact of our gracious, loving actions. We are to accept and love the unlovable as well as the lovable. Even to the degree that one man said to his wife, um, whose name was Larry, I die for you, my love. And his wife replied and said, Oh, Larry, you're always saying that, but you never do it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, so love must be acceptance and also it must be verbal to the point of actually saying this, whether it's your to your teenage daughter or your 23-year-old son. And so when was the last time you told your spouse that you appreciate and respect her? Um, so love must be communicated verbally. Um, it must not be assumed. And so then, um, I think it's been a while since we talked about the love languages. Oh, did I? Oh, here's, here's the last point. Christ does not care about ritual. Again, think of that chart between relationship and religion. Christ does not care about ritual but only about good doctrine showing itself in love. Okay. And all of our major doctrine is drenched in love, so therefore it should be part of our everyday lives and our attitudes toward people who even hate us. And that's really a tough one to do. That's, a, that's, like, a, that's like climbing a um, climbing the Himalayas. It's like a spiritual challenge. It's like if you really want to be tested, love somebody who hates you. And, and it's it's a mind blower. I mean, I, I'm, I've had, I'm not saying I've had perfect success in that. I haven't, but I I was like there was there was um, you know I I told I think I shared this in church a few years ago and it happened and I know I share it in the newcomers classes about the about the atheist guy who you know threatened to sue me and everything about the city council prayer and everything. And so it's like okay, I this is like climbing the spiritual Mount Everest here. I'm, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to love this guy. I don't care how much it goes against my natural inclinations, but I, this is like the perfect opportunity to love. 
And so I prayed for him. I took him out to lunch. I talked to him and answered questions and stuff because I was determined to love this guy because I knew that that is what we're supposed to do. It wasn't easy and I wasn't totally successful in it, but I still made an effort. I think probably the easiest way to love people who are unlovable is to pray for them. That's a good way to start. And then you're then at least my attitude toward other people who haven't been very nice to me changes over time. It takes some time. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen immediately. But praying for them is probably the um, most efficient and effective way that you're at, you can change your attitude toward loving somebody who's not lovable. So Christ does not care about ritual, but only about good doctrine, which we have, showing itself in love. So how has believing the right thing led you to the right feelings and behavior? Um, that's a question that you can answer. Or another question that you can answer is uh, if it's all about showing love to people, we've got the foundation of the doctrine, but then how do we do it? And I think the love languages are a really practical, helpful tool to be able to effectively love other people um, and knowing them better and also knowing yourself better. And of course, you guys have all heard about the love languages, right? The five love languages. and They're pretty culturally popular. And uh, the theory is, is that everyone has at least one way that they receive love and frequently we use that one way to show love to other people. But they may have a different love language. See, that's the thing that we have to know uh, because the default setting is your love language, how you receive love. So if it's words of encouragement, if it's acts of service, if it's small gifts, if it's quality time or physical touch, that's probably going to be the way that you automatically try to love other people. But it's a good question to ask your wives. Um, it's a good question to ask your kids. It's like, what is the primary way that you receive love? And then pour most of your efforts in loving that person uh, into them through that particular love language. So how many of you guys have the love language of words of encouragement? What's your primary, primary love language? Raise your hand. Words of encouragement that I say, hey, good job, or like, I like your shirt, or, <laughs> you know, nice haircut, or whatever it might be. Saying something positive and that's your love language. Another one is acts of service, meaning it's like, oh, I do something for you, and it's like, man, you cut my lawn, or you did my laundry, that was so nice, I feel really loved. Um, small gifts, it has to be small, because if I gave you a car or a house or a million dollars, that's everyone's love language, right? So, so it has to be something small, like a candy or flowers or some small token, like a pocket knife or something. And it's like, man, I really feel loved by you because you gave me this small inexpensive thing. Um, quality time is like, hey, let's let's go to lunch or let's do an activity together or let's go for a walk together and talk. And that is, uh, today is the 39th anniversary of my first date with Carolyn, right? September 29th, 1982 was our first date. And we sat in the Pompton Queen Diner in Pompton Lakes, New Jersey we sat there for six hours and talked from eight o'clock at night till two in the morning. And I learned that night, because this is 20 years before the book was written, but I knew that quality time was her love language because <laughs> she loved to spend time. She loves to spend time with her family and her friends. And so that's Carolyn's primary love language. And then physical touch is kind of like, um, you know, give them somebody a hug or a handshake or a pat on the back. Some people, I think physical touch is their anti-love language. It's like their hate language because they don't want to be touched. They want their personal zone, you know. So it's, it's caring and loving and doctrinally accurate to enter into someone's world and say, what's your love language? I want to love you better, you know. And, um, and then to actually do it is pure biblical Christianity. Jesus, Paul said that's the only thing that really counts is faith or good doctrine showing itself in love. So it's those two important elements. Um, truth, good doctrine, showing itself through love, care, grace, mercy. Um, those two important um, 
aspects of the Christian life. So anybody you want to, okay, I'm going to ask you, okay, what's your primary, primary love language? Let's go in reverse order. Physical touch, which, raise your hand if that's your, okay, so everybody give you a hearty handshake at the end. Roy, <laughs> Roy wants a hug. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have a group hug afterwards. <laughs> okay, so we got two guys, physical touch. How about quality time? Anybody have quality time? Okay. Very good. We have two quality time. Um, how about small gifts? Who wants some candy or fo- a pocket knife? David, did you raise your hand? Okay. Small gifts, very nice. Um, acts of service. Okay, so who wants their lawn mowed? <laughs> Who wants their car washed? <laughs> Naveen, okay. We know how to love Naveen over there. Just do something nice for the guy. All right. How about words of encouragement? Oh, yeah. That's one, two, three, four, five. That's kind of my first or second one. So six. That's, uh, I, I've done an informal survey of like the last 20, 25 years. Uh, I asked the marriage boot camp the question too. And, and uh, can you guess the top two for women, because there's a lot of exceptions. It's not just these two, but there's a lot of exceptions. Can you guess the top two love languages for women? Quality time, physical services. Uh, quality time is one. What's the other one? Yes. Yeah, those are the top two. Um, quality time, you know, most women have more friends than most men do. You know, we're just, <laughs> we're not too good at that sometimes, but so, and, and they love to uh, have time spent with them. Women want to be enjoyed. Um, and acts of service, they take that as an, uh, as an act of love when they are taken care of. Something good is done for them. Now, can you guess the top two? Again, there's a lot of exceptions here, but just the top two for, for men. I heard words of encouragement and yep, yeah, those are the yeah, top two. Not necessarily that order, but those are def- definitely up there. So, can you guys? Uh, how many of you uh, have had an experience using the love languages uh, in your marriage and your, with your children, um, with your parents, whoever it might be, a significant people in your life? Have any thoughts on that or experiences? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts or experiences with the love languages? Have you ever discussed it with your wife? Yeah, there's been things we discussed about. It's definitely, I think, uh, something that, uh, I don't know, I think it's always good when you have that thought on it because it comes, you know, across a little more meaningful when you use the other person's language, whatever it is, that the the way they like to be loved, it comes, I think it, it comes across like, hey, this person's, and I think it really comes across when um, they know that yours isn't that one particularly, and they're like, oh, wow, okay, now they're really stepping out of their comfort zone and, and putting my, you know, thinking about me and, mm-hmm. and what I need, and so, yeah. um, and it's it's also I think interesting to see it in your kids. Like mm-hmm. I think it really stands out when you're like, oh okay, mm-hmm. they 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 when you really start figuring out what their particular love language is and you see how their behavior totally changes and mm-hmm. I think it's pretty cool. So. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. It's it's also an observation that you can make. It's like wow, I know which one one of our kids are more like Carolyn and which ones are more like me. <laughs> you know, in terms of how they uh, process love. Yeah. Want it? And of course, I, you know, I want the good ones more like me, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I hope Heather doesn't watch this. But anyway, <laughs> we'll just cut that part out. We'll edit it. <laughs> Tim, edit that out, please. Thanks. <laughs> Any thoughts on the love languages? Uh, I, one of the saddest. Uh, whenever I think about the love languages, I feel kind of melancholy too. Because when I I just read the book, and there was this uh, couple. Uh, in the church, this is like this is like 24, 25 years ago, and they 
they came to me because they were just about to get divorced and they wound up getting divorced but I, I explained the love languages to them and they um, I asked them so what do you think the other one's love language is after I explained it and they both got it wrong mm -hmm. and that was tragic because all these years in the beginning they were probably authentically trying to fill each other's love tanks up you know uh, to love one another and they were speaking a different language it was like speaking Japanese or Kiswahili to somebody who doesn't understand it. But you're like, you know, you know, when someone doesn't know your language, you, if you yell louder, you know, they'll understand it. Right? <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference. And they're not getting the message. And so it was just so sad to see that. But by then their trust levels were shot and gone. And uh, there were some other factors too, but um, didn't work out. So, um, Anyway, uh, any any other thoughts about the love languages? Okay. So far, we have heard about the love languages. I think Gene and I tried to exp express love to each other in the language that appealed to us. So I would try to love her the way I wanted to be loved. She would try to love me the way she wanted to be loved. Yes. And so it was like, oh, you mean there's a different way? We should be going for what their love language is, not the one that appeals to us. <laughs> yeah, we just make that assumption. It's like everybody, well, everybody's like us. Of course, we don't think that. We just do that. And then we don't understand when the other person doesn't get it, right? So yeah. that's the beauty of this. It also enhances objectivity. You know, it's like it... We're naturally subjective. It's we're in our own little world. We're selfish. We're we're, we're the um, center of the universe, and this kind of takes us out of that and says, "Okay, no, other people are different, <laughs> and sometimes we need to flex to their need, right?" And so, um, and that also helps us too. Like uh, psychologists see objectivity as a really healthy trait, and that's a big part of maturity too, is becoming objective to where you can evaluate yourself and the world around you from third person as opposed to just inside yourself, you know. So when we think about the greatest need that others have, love, you know, that's a good place to start and it uh, spreads out to other interests and things like that. So you, see, you can see like just the basis of our theology is so important to like take it out of the ethereal and put it into practical use. It's a very powerful thing. Again, because it's so unique too. We're the, this Biblical Christianity is the only faith system or philosophy or religion, whatever you want to call it, that has this feature. Right? Others have it to much, much lesser degrees and some ha don't have it at all, but Christianity, biblical Christianity, I have to put that adjective in front of Christianity because we can't just assume it's Christianity, otherwise you can come up with 50 different definitions, right? So anyway, very good. Who'd like to close us in prayer tonight? Any volunteers? Do we have to volunteer somebody? <laughs> See, the ladies are out already. <laughs> I'm going to keep you people here until someone raises their hand. <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteer? Just has to be a short prayer. Please. Thanks, George. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and Lord, we praise you for who you are. Lord, we pray that you would go with us as we go about our week and that you would guide our steps and our thoughts and our words. That we would bring glory and honor unto you. That we would reflect your love to those around us. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir.